Everything was clear. In life, everything was obscure and embroiled. And um, so that's the um, quote which I uh, sort of start off with. But um, as I was um, uh, subsequent to uh, preparing the talk, I've been reading Goethe's Faust, and uh, there's a quote from there which I think is apposite to, it's quite simple, it's, what is uttered from the heart alone will win the hearts of others to your own. And uh, so I feel that's also uh, sort of quite sort of central to what I'm saying. So many years ago when I was uh, training here in London, I was in analysis and I'd just taken on my first training case and after my first session with uh, the patient I reported the experience uh, to my analyst um, and then I said rather apologetically uh, oh but I didn't make a transference interpretation and so the analyst asked what's the purpose of making a transference interpretation? So I replied rather sheepishly, uh, uh, well, it's to generate psychic change. <laughs> and uh, there was a, a pause. And then he said, he spoke, it's to remove an obstacle between the analyst and the patient. And that uh, simple, but quite straightforward uh, sort of assertion went like a sort of fertile missile to my heart and uh, for two reasons. Because every time I'd heard the word transference while I was training here in London, I thought I should bow and genuflect. <laughs> it was clearly the goal and was to be worshipped as such. And here was this analyst, my analyst, saying it's not the goal at all. The fertilizing agent was actually the connection between the two persons and that the transcendent was an, when there was an obstacle to this, this is what the transcendent interpretation was about, was to remove the obstacle. And it had, a, uh, it had the most profound effect uh, upon me because um, if that's the case, um, uh, that the actual connection between the two persons opening themselves to each other, uh, that th it was this that was the enriching quality. I had such fruitful engagements prior to entering analysis and I've also had many since finishing the formal process. Um, <clears throat> So this was one reason why that uh, remark had such a, uh, an effect on me. Uh, the other reason is I'd never in fact heard anyone say that before, nor funnily enough have I ever heard someone say it since. Uh, and so it was clear to me this was something that he himself had thought out. And actually the whole way he conducted the analysis with me was clear to me that it was actually the relationship between the core, hit the core of him touching the core of me and that that really was the uh, uh, effective uh, agent of, of change. And uh, um, one thing I do know, because I've taken a particular interest in, in recent years in the treatment of psychotic patients, and I do know that a, a patient who is psychotic will only ever be touched by something uh, that the analyst says if it's truly what the analyst thinks. Um, and it's only when I came to formulate this many years later that I realized that the prime psychotic patient must be myself. It was rather an alarming realization. But uh, of this I'm absolutely certain which is that only those things that truly come from the person's own heart uh, are effective. And I remember someone said to me um, uh, recently who seemed to have benefited by uh, coming for therapy, uh, and she said, do you know the reason? 
is I've never heard you say a thing that you don't truly think. And so uh, I'm quite certain that that is uh, an effective agent. Also, as um, was read out that I uh, studied philosophy and uh, um, uh, theology before coming to the world of psychoanalysis, and one of the most um, um, powerful sort of things that changed and uh, had a huge effect on me was um, attending for a whole year four lectures a week by um, uh, a philosopher uh, on the subject of ontology. Now you may think that's a very abstract uh, thing because ontology is about being. It's incidentally what beyond meant by O, ontos, being being. And, uh, but one of the reasons it had such an effect on me was the philosopher giving these talks, and there were four lectures a week for a year, so about 200 lectures in the year. I could absolutely tell that uh, all the things that he said were really what he himself had thought out, and they weren't just uh, sort of reiterating truths that he'd uh, learned from some textbook. Um, I say all this because, unfortunately, uh, a lot of uh, what I'd call pseudo transference interpretations um, uh, get made. I remember a lady I was supervising, uh, I said to her, did you feel this transference interpretation you've just made is true? No, she replied, but I thought I ought to make it. Uh, uh, and but that one lady could re I could replicate that by by many others, and so it's um, and I was saying to someone actually outside before coming in, I think it's one of the ways in which somehow training can actually get in the way of one's own natural sense of uh, what to say and what to do. Now, uh, if it's true that this is the connection between two engaged persons and it's this connection that expands the mind and makes, uh, can make creative wonders happen, um, then we have to ask, is this happening in our consulting rooms? Uh, has this core matter been at the center of our training? Uh, I'm only entitled, of course, to answer this for myself it was certainly not what was primary in my training experience. Uh, it was, as I say, in my analysis, but not actually in the experience of seminars and so on. The uh, 14th century uh, Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart, said that making primary uh, what is in fact secondary is the root of all error, and I've always thought that's one of the wisest statements uh, ever made. <laughs> uh, so the question is, what is unfolding today in our consulting rooms? Uh, are we really focusing on what is primary? So let us state that what is primary in psychoanalysis or psychotherapy based on psychoanalysis is the opening of two engaged persons to each other. What is secondary are the practical arrangements to enable this encounter to occur. If I'm going to meet someone, I have to arrange a time and a location. And in ordinary life, the length of time of such a meeting varies, but usually there's a sense between the two persons of when the encounter has lasted a sufficient time for the two people to have managed a realignment of their inner lives. There is a sense that a longer time would only hamper and perhaps uh, stretch out and not necessarily deepen the inner process. There are of course some famous occasions uh, where that's not been true. For instance, the first occasion when Jung met Freud, they spoke together for 13 hours non-stop but that's uh, unusual. Um, there's no doubt that the practical secondary factors have very often been made primary in many psychoanalytic institutes and psychotherapy institutes based on it. 
So the question Meister Eckhart said that making what is secondary primary is the root of all error. And the question is, why? And I think it's because what is primary then becomes smothered. If one thinks of psychoanalysis as the analyst seeing someone on the couch for 50 minutes, five days a week as primary, then in my mind a very serious error has occurred. And this is because what is primary, the substance of the thing, has been smothered. And for instance, I um, see currently um, uh, a man who comes um, uh, once in every 10 weeks, mustn't be 11 or it mustn't be 9, once in every 10 weeks for a two-hour session. I have not the slightest doubt that he's in analysis. Therefore, the physical presence of the other person uh, also may not actually be necessary because if we think of it, I think we all know that when an analysis is finished, uh, the analysis goes on. My analysis finished, what, um, I don't know, 35 years ago or something like that, and uh, uh, I've been in analysis ever since and I've got no doubt about that. So it's also, uh, the analyst, there's a, there can be what one might call a psychic presence. And um, I'll give you uh, two examples of this. I finished what I call my formal analysis and one holiday I was reading uh, George Eliot's Middlemarch and I'd come to the passage describing the marriage between Lydgate and Rosamond. Uh, Rosamond was what uh, one might call a femme fatale and Lydgate realized that his wife no longer loved him. And George Eliot says the following. The first great disappointment must be born. The tender devotedness and docile adoration of the ideal wife must be renounced. And life must be taken up on a lower stage of expectation as it is by men who have lost their limbs. But the real wife had not only her claim, she had still a hold on his heart, and it was his intense desire that the hold should remain strong. In marriage, the certainty she will never love me much is easier to bear than the fear I shall love her no more. Hence, his inward effort was to entirely excuse her and blame the hard circumstances which were partly his own fault, he said to himself. Now this opened up an understanding for me at the time that it was a greater disaster to cease to love than the pain of not being loved. Uh, George Eliot was alive to me at that moment. Um, uh, she was my analyst at that moment. My relation to her and her relation to me bore fruit in a new sort of understanding of the spirit and my emotional life was enriched. This is one example, and down the years there have been many, many others. This is, true, this is the true analysis of which the formal analysis was the gateway opening this new channel of revelation. Today I can say every day a new understanding develops for me. I'm in analysis. I'm saying this to emphasize that this analysis is conducted without uh, an analyst as normally understood, without what would be recognized as an interpretation, without a couch. Though in fact, when um, I was reading um, George Eliot's novel, I was lying on a sofa at four in the morning uh, uh, when I read this uh, quote. So those who uh, want to put the secondary first can say, well, he was on a couch. Um, so, uh, what I'm saying is all these secondary matters do not constitute the substance uh, of analysis. They are secondary. And what is primary, what makes an analysis, is a relationship which fertilizes into understanding. And this is what uh, psychoanalysis truly is. Um, some uh, 
years ago, about uh, 10 years ago, I came to know uh, quite well uh, a Benedictine abbot, uh, abbot of a Benedictine monastery in Western Australia. And um, I spent some time uh, in conversation with him. Um, uh, quite a few, over a few years, I would see him I don't know, a few times every year. And it was not what was called psychotherapy. He didn't make any interpretations, but he was a very deep thinking, wise character. And I have absolutely no doubt that uh, my own emotional life was enriched through these conversations. And uh, see, one of the things that what I'm saying is, of course, is that uh, the essential process of psychoanalysis can happen uh, between persons who've never heard of psychoanalysis. And I'll just give you a, a little example, but it, it, um, it struck me very forcibly. About five or six years ago, uh, I was in Denmark, and I arrived at um, uh, the airport, not of Copenhagen, but of Aarhus, which is the second biggest uh, city in Denmark. And I had to get into the city uh, so I uh, hailed a taxi and it was about an hour's drive into the city and so um, the taxi driver asked me what my profession was and I said I'm a psychoanalyst and the, the normal sort of jokes that normally happen when one uh, sort of reveals that professional identity.